Awesome. So we appreciate everybody showing up. We knew we are on July 4th Eve. They should make that a new title, July 4th Eve. Um, but we really appreciate everybody being here. We're also really thankful that Zach was able to make it. Um, after we're done the main part of the presentation, Zach is an IRA specialist with Quest Trust. We'll let him do a quick introduction when we're, we get going, but he will be here to answer any specific questions because you'll see in our disclaimer, we are not professionals in certain things. So uh, sometimes when it's time to bring in a professional, we always like to, to make sure that you get the best information. So we're ready to get started here. Um, we're gonna try to keep you in and out within the hour tonight, because I know a lot of you are getting ready. So this is the Massive Masters Wednesday case study. Again, we thank everybody for coming here. These are always recorded and you can watch them within 48 hours. This is an educational webinar. So we're not giving any professional advice, any legal advice, any investing advice. Um, tonight we are obviously talking about using retirement funds, which is powerful. Um, I'm actually talking a lot from my own experience as well as Sharar and Mike. We've all invested very heavily with our, our retirement funds and a lot of the massive capital investors do as well. So we get ready to get going here. We have a bus tour. If you can imagine, we're doing a bus tour in Houston. We're pretty excited about it. It is our first bus tour that we're putting on. Um, it's a new event that's happening on Saturday, July the 13th. Again, it's in Houston. Um, I'm going to put a link into the chat because I didn't figure out how to make a QR code. <laughs> so I'm going to put this in there. Um, and it's, it starts, you're going to show up at 8.30 in the morning and register. We're going to talk about the Passive Investor Network that we're partnering with on this particular event. And then you're going to be doing a bus tour followed up by a lunch. And so there's the location that you can do. You can click in and sign in. Um, it's a great, great opportunity for you to actually connect with people and of course, go see some uh, some multifamily apartments. All right, so tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about massive capital, the massive value, that, uh, boy, I can't talk, value add investors and partners. Tonight, we're gonna talk about winning using self-directed retirement funds to invest. Again, a very powerful way for you to be able to access some usually non-disposable money and put it to work in one of the most powerful investments. And tonight we'll have a little bit more time for Q and A. So a little bit about massive capital owner operator value add multifamily, a developer in triple net retail town centers. You can see on the map, we are very Texas heavy. We do have assets in Denver, North Carolina and Georgia. Uh, we have our partners, Realty One. They have about 290 million in assets. We have 203 million in assets. We're on the equity fund, triple net brokerage. So that's on the retail development side, the brokerage, same with the property management, same with the land development, same with the construction. Massive Capital also has a tech arm and Massive Masters where you can join us and actually learn how to underwrite deals, work on deals. We take our people that are in our mastermind all the way from looking at a deal all the way through and then actually how do we operate it at the end. So super powerful for you to be able to learn a little bit. I am going to put a link in the chat, just a little bit our mastermind and then reach out to any one of us. So you see there's Brandon Maria here on the call. Um, Mike's actually driving up to up to Illinois, going back to the motherland uh, to visit his family for the July 4th. So it's, it's a long drive from Houston to, to Illinois. All right, so some of our current activities, for those of you who've been around for a while, 22 and 23, we did 15 closings. We still have a bit of room in our 204 unit in San Antonio. So if you are an accredited investor, and you would like to have an estimated 2.11 multiple of your money projected 18% IRR comes with a seven pref with obviously lots of tax advantages. This is an investment for you. So make sure you understand $100,000 investment five years later, 
turns into $211,000 investment. And we're also taking retirement funds. So we have an LOI accepted in San Antonio, one in Houston. We're under contract for a retail development. It'll be one of Massive's partnering with Realty One, but it'll be one of our biggest real, uh, real estate developments. We have another one also in West Texas under contract. And again, we're just finishing up our value add on the, add, sorry, we're finishing our raise on the Horizon Apartments. Great opportunity. I uh, visited the property a couple of weeks ago. And our vi when I first visited, there was a defunct pool with nothing in it. And then I visited again and the pool was full of kids, cool furniture with parents sitting there watching it. Um, and they were doing har hamburger barbecues. So uh, it is pretty cool that we've been able to do that resident event. We have secret. You know what a secret is? It's a 506B deal that we can't talk about because this is a public forum. But do you know what that means? If you wanna know what the secret is, you have to book an appointment with someone from Massive Capital. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat. And again, book an appointment with us. We can talk to you, help you be able to get onto your way for financial freedom. Massive Masters, it talks about value add of being able to do by learning. So you really want to make sure that you check out our Massive Masters learning by actually doing. So this is a little bit about our tech stack. So one of the things when you do, when you get to join in with Massive Capital, we have a portal. We can customize the portal with your company logos, with your brands. You'll get a unique thing for people to be able to register, get access to our deals, but it's a way for capital raisers to be able to keep their investors private to themselves, to be able to communicate with their investors, but also has access to the amazing deals that Massive Capital offers. And the nice thing about this, Trevor, I'm going to jump in here, yeah. is that this, when you join and you raise capital with Massive, you're not paying for these services. So this, this platform is what the investors use to raise money or to invest their money in a safe platform for the investors. They get to see their money. They get to see where it's invested. They get all of their information, their documents. This is where everything will be held. And you, as the co-sponsor, are not having to pay for this platform. And that is the same for Monday.com, Client Harbor, which is our CRM. Well, um, this is another picture of uh, Cashflow Portal. And then this one over here is our Client Harbor, which shows how we are monitoring our call logs and how we're contacting all of our investors. Yeah, so it's pretty all powerful to be able to get all of these backend things included. And again, they can all be personalized with your information, uh, which is a great way for you to be able to build your, you know, capital allocator business. So this is another thing that we have. This is called monday.com. Every deal that goes through massive capital goes into this. I think we've had 1,200 deals we've underwritten. I was on a call with a guy today, and he said, how are you guys getting so many deals? And I said, we're working super hard. So if you look at it, we've underwritten 1,200 deals, probably made about 120 offers to get 9 or 10 or 11 deals um, that go. So, you know, you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the prince. Um, but this is where it is, right? Finding the prince is what truly brings the value add to what that we're able to offer, what we'll be able to do. That's how you make the money by finding the right deal at the right price. And so this is all access. It's a really interesting, it's a really great way for us to work on it. And then all the folks in our mastermind have access to all of this. So these are all of the stages. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. We talk about it, but all the stages, right? So you, you're going to do an acquisition of an asset. You can see all of those things happen. Then you have to arrange the equity and the debt. So all of these things have to happen. And then, of course, you're on the asset management part of a deal. That third one is actually the biggest portion of this, right? The first one may take three months and then a month to do the middle one. 
And then you're in that last one for five years operating and managing a deal. And that's where having really, really strong partners um, makes a really good play. And again, with our massive mastermind, all of our mastermind people go through all of these stages with us. So again, learning by doing. So again, little pyramid here, right? Done for you, high ticket price. If you're gonna do it done with you, mid ticket price, do it yourself, low ticket price, but a lot more work, okay? So again, the idea is if you want to accelerate your journey to be able to get to have more things, our goal is to help you accelerate your journey to being an active real estate sponsor. All right, you want to talk a little bit? I feel, I feel like I'm taking over, Sharar. You always do such a great job. I'm going to let hey, you cut you're in. You're doing fantastic. You're <laughs> doing fantastic, man. Keep at it. Go okay. for it. Wrap it up. Then, okay. then I'll, I'll pick it up after this. Okay, perfect. All right, so again, um, underwriting all the deal flow asset, all of the property and strategy imp yeah, implementation, and then best-in-class tools. So again, these are all the things that we offer to folks that are part of our mastermind. It's a great way for you to be able to actually learn by doing, okay? Can't say that enough. Um, super powerful to be able to do it. Um, I, I, we've got a few new students too. I gotta tell you, I love the energy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's always, it's so powerful as such a group effort. Um, absolutely powerful as a group effort and that, you know, the new folks challenge the existing folks, you know, so we have certain ways of doing things and somebody will say, well, why are you doing that? And it's like, you know, let's think about that, right? It's, uh, it, it's actually, you learn a lot by, by working with people and, you know, if you ever want to understand something properly, figure out how to teach it and then you're really going to learn it. So. Ever, awesome. thank you. Uh, yeah, really All right. appreciate it. So, go ahead. You go ahead. You're good. Uh, so if you go back to a couple of more slides, uh, it, uh, I want to share a couple of things. Like today, uh, we have our daily underwriting call, and it started as a typical multifamily. Then we went to triple net. We underwrote two developments. We underwrote two offices. <laughs> then we had, what, two and a half hours straight underwriting call today. So that was really interesting. Uh, so we, we uh, save, I mean, we really... Uh, typically underestimate the amount of skills that goes in and the time it takes to build up the skill set for underwriting. That's like one third of the equation or one fourth of the equation. Then you know, two fourth is the asset management. And then another one fourth is equity raising and equity management, right? So fund management, fund, you know, uh, structuring a fund, raising for the fund, operations of the fund alone, it's a skill set. And Whoever is a fund manager, right? Always we said go backwards from if you're if you want to know the name, that that manager must know what the difference between the asset classes, the underwriting style, the distribution of the risk, hence the return, right? Not all 17% are made the same, uh, even though end of the day return is 17%, right? Uh, so not all three years are built the same. Uh, so understanding those takes a lot and it doesn't happen. Uh, unless you do a, a you know high amount of underwriting, right? So that's why it's we learn just like with everybody else, we learn by actively underwriting. Uh, so it was it was really interesting on how today's call uh, kind of went about. Thank you, Trevor. Let's let's get started. All right. Um, so all right. So story time. Before I get into that one, so uh, I went to Austin today to had I had three meetings and I also walked uh, a couple of sites uh, that we have. Uh, to, on that note, I was talking to. Uh, first meeting was with my banker. Uh, so she has been, she has seen me personally coming in into uh, real estate 2017, and I've been working with her uh, since 2017, right? From single family house loan all the way down to. Uh, big construction loans. And the interesting part was after talking to her whole thing, I was explaining how I am uh, managing my earning synthetically uh, at a certain layer 
because of the tax optimization. And to do that, I'm using two vehicles, right? Which is my Roth IRA and my Roth Solo 401k. So I can explain to her how I'm managing that. Then she goes, uh, can you give me a name who I can go talk to, to move my 401k into a Roth IRA? Then I said Quest uh, name. So Quest has been with us, at least I have been with Quest personally uh, going on almost four years now. I have done, I don't know, over 40, no, not 40, almost my personal account, plenty of uh, transactions on the IRA. So most of our conversation that we'll talk about here is what we have done as a user, not what the book says. Book is there on top of that we're using it. And then we have Zach uh, here to, you know, uh, to get, help us uh, give you a much more detailed question. So before I get started, uh, Zach, uh, but do you want to go give a quick introduction about you and, and, and Quest? Then I can jump into the talk. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you guys for having us out. You know, this is something that we always like to like to talk about. You know, over the past couple of years, it's become much more popular, uh, I guess, much more well known uh, that you can actually utilize these funds for things uh, like investments outside of the you know traditional assets, right? Secure that most people will you know isolate their their accounts too. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Zach Wilson. I'm one of the IRA specialists at Quest Trust Company. And who we are is we really we're just a self directed IRA custodian. Best way to think about us is essentially we are just the private sector version of companies like TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, or Fidelity, right? They allow you to take your retirement funds and put them into public assets. We allow you to take those same retirement funds within the same types of accounts and put them into privately held assets. Things like uh, things like real estate, things like private money lending, things like private entities in the case like multifamily syndications or syndications in general. Right. So we allow just you to take those same retirement vehicles and let except now you're utilizing the knowledge that you have being in this space to direct those funds into assets that are a little bit more tangible assets that you have a little bit more knowledge of and that aren't just kind of set to the whims of the overall public public sphere. All right. So that's who we are. Um, and I'll let you take from here. Any questions you guys have regarding your IRAs, your 401ks, anything like that, investing into these types of uh, these types of assets. I'm here to help. Thank you. Thank you, really appreciate it. So as we get into a full disclaimer on behalf of master teams, we are not attorneys, we're not CPAs, we're not a, you know, any, we don't have any professional license. All the things here are for educational purposes and from our own experiences, please consult the professionals as you make your own decision, right? Uh, so, and as you know, on the real estate investing side of it, it's a cash flow is important than you know, the long-term appreciations, right? You uh, know, yes, price went up, yes, interest rate went up. In a sense, it's, it's went up twice. Uh, so, but still the appreciation is there, even though there is a dip, there's always a correction and there's, you know, uh, it, it, whatever way you can do a sample of all the transactions, all the historical trend, uh, it's cost, inflation is real. Uh, so cost of capital is real. At the same time, appreciation is always there. There are two kinds of appreciation. One is the organic appreciation, and then also you have the synthetic appreciation. On the residential side, it's typically organic that you see. Price just goes up, people make more money, they spend more money, and they like to stay in a certain area. Competition happens, price goes up. And the synthetic one is you force it because on the commercial side, it's all about the cash flow. Uh, you take a worst asset in a, in a very poor location asset, but it cash flows, price is high. And you take an asset in a very good location, doesn't cash flow, price is low, right? So sometimes you can design the cash flow more. So that's how we can kind of increase the value of it. On the multifamily side, that is the typical play. So on the appreciation, there's always two, organic and synthetic. Synthetic one was we kind of push it in. Then we have the leverage. Uh, so what I, I mean, the leverage, what we say, if I have $100,000 and I make you know, 5% of the money, $100,000 all cash, I make 5 or 10% return of that one. Is it good? Or I take the 100 grand, leverage up to half a million, and I make 5% of that, right? So leverage always amplifies the uh, total pool and the return is bigger. So you can share with everybody else, makes sense. So that financing is a crucial uh, you know, ingredient to your return that we have. Also the diversification, right? Massive always says you need to, just like your equity, you know, uh, investment pool only by stock. You always say, I want to buy certain segments, certain stock, then I know a certain type of assets, certain type of revenue generating company. I'd say have a blended model. Same thing. Uh, we always say same thing that you should do as an investor. We do it in the real estate. Build your portfolio. Build your portfolio in terms of a time horizon. Don't put every single asset that will 
come back to you at the same time. Uh, distribute that out. Uh, do it something for two years, something for three years, something for five years, and you know then that's one way. That's a time distribution, and the other one is the location distribution. Do something in Texas, Houston, you know, different than Austin, it's different than Dallas, and then do in a different cities. Then also you can do an asset class distribution. Once you mix and match it up, your portfolio should be in a spot where, hey, you have some part of a portfolio gives you cash flow return, some uh, part of your portfolio gets you a faster and a return uh, than the others, and some part of your portfolio will give you overall a higher return. So in a sense, you have a blended approach, and that's how we recommend, that's how we do it, and that's how we, we bring projects uh, to our investors as well. So that's why when you see uh, most of our assets, we distribute it out. We have land development play, and we have you know, retail center development play, and we have multifamily play. The cash flow appreciation, faster high velocity return. And this is again it's a high velocity return. Thus we blend it, we blend all those in. So you can you can build a risk adjusted portfolio that would help you whether through you know the upcycle, down cycle, or and or your own personal needs, right? And the last thing is the tax benefit. So when we get the interesting part, when we try to solve uh, our project return, again we try to solve for three things cash flow tax adjusted cash flow and uh, you know, overall return. So, and the timing. So cash flow and tax adjusted cash flow would be uh, tax adjusted cash flow. That's the biggest chunk. Then how quickly I can get the money back. That's my you know, second you know, thing that we kind of check out. And the last thing is what's my total overall return. And we typically see you know, two of the three that you can do. New construction, new development, land development, their high velocity return and faster, no tax. I mean, no tax depreciation. Multifamily, a little bit longer, but you get appreciation. And so you have depreciation and you have a cash flow. And so if you have blended both, it works out really fine. So tax benefit, it's a really crucial part of your you know, investment hypothesis that we have. So hence today's conversation is, hey, how do I manage my tax, right? And, and for that tax side, there's, so there's a couple of things I would you know, share. Conventional th you know, thought process, there's a loophole, you follow the loophole, but that's not really true. The truth is, follow the books. It's an open book test. The more you read, the more you study, more you know what it says to do, and we just follow. That's exactly it, right? Yeah, it's not a whole. It's open for everybody. Whoever feels like doing it, go do it. If you don't do it, that's because you haven't even hung out. Right? Ask the question, how do you do it? Then, then you can kind of do it. So whatever conversation that we talk about here that is available for everybody independent to your income level independent to your location and earning power whatever it is so that is the beauty of it there's there's rules that we have it's it's open for everybody uh, example i started my Roth IRA four years ago with five thousand dollars because i could not backdoor and that's the max i could backdoor my way in and um, because of my w2 income but that that is in a different school, to a totally different size right now, right? Uh, so that's one. And the second thing is we all want to pay tax. Tax avoidance is not the play. Choosing the time when to tax is the play, right? Time value of money. So we, we, we follow rules. We want to pay the taxes. You want to be the best citizens ever. Tax got the right place to go. And all thing is I want to... We want to be able to control the time and the time will be as far away as I can. The further I pay the tax down the way, I have more money with me to reinvest. So it's a time value of money. If I can get some extra money to invest today for free, government's going to let me have the money at 0%. Why not? And that's the beauty of the, you know, the IRA, the Roth IRA, the 401k, depending on how you get in and what you want to get out is tax will happen at some point in time. It's just not today, tomorrow, day after. It's just some point in time. In between, let us make some money. Beauty is, if I have to pay the tax 10 years down the way, I'll pay it. But from now till the 10th year, all the profit we make out of the extra money that we had, we get to keep it. So why not, right? So I would say everybody, we pay taxes. It's just not today, far away, in some far away time, whenever is, is that time is. And our goal is to optimize our income and earning it that way. Okay, let's uh, let's get to the second slide. Uh, so the tax, oh, sorry, okay, yes. So again, uh, the typical 
benefits that we get from the solo for self-directed uh, 401k or IRA, and we have come to you know, a couple of other blended uh, IRAs there, Roth IRA, Roth solo, uh, Roth, you know, solo 401k or Roth solo 401k, whatever you want to call it, it's tax deferred growth. That's the key, tax deferred growth. And then the other one is tax-free withdrawal. That depends on how long I want to stay into the in account, when am I breaking it? But if going in, our first goal is the tax deferred growth. And then when the time comes, I will pay the taxes and then you can and work with your consultant, your CPA and or you know, custodian, you can design how you can withdraw the money either tax-free or with a very minimal tax as you go through. Uh, for, you know, I'll share some data. Me and Mike, we both come from oil and gas industry, Fortune 5. And both of us, when we came about, we had pensions. And when, uh, and when you leave your pension with your previous company, it grows at a 3%-ish, a little bit higher than inflation. So at Shell, uh, it was growing at a 3%. So it was better for me not to leave the pension with Shell and wait for whatever time that I'm, and I have a long way to go hopefully, uh, then collect my pension. It was easier for me to take a lump sum value and redeploy and get a faster, better uh, rate of return so I can multiply my money a you know, couple of times before I even get to the retirement. So if you have a pension somewhere else, you're keeping there, ask, ask your custodian, what is the rate of return your tax or your pension amount is growing? And then you ask the question, if you get a lump sum amount, what the amount you get? And then you do a calculation. If I can get 15, 20% return on the lump sum amount over the course of a decade, is it more? Or if I leave my pension with my company for that 15, 20 years at a 3%, is it more? Whatever it is, you can make a you know, choice. For me, it was better to take my pension out lump sum, get into the 401k, and then you know, <clears throat> I amplify that more. Another one is depreciation deduction. Uh, that may or may not be in the place, uh, depending on how you design it. Uh, usually on the you know, uh, 401k, the, we cannot take depreciation in. Uh, that's not the way, uh, because to take the depreciation, you got to be active. And we cannot be active when you're bringing money from the an IRA. But the, so the key point is tax deferred. Defer the tax as much as you can. And then there are some other nuances to it, depending on when you do levered versus unlevered. Um, so, you know, but... First thing is tax deferred growth as much as you can, and you know, push the due date for the tax, and that's the biggest benefit uh, of the IRA money. Right. All right. So let's let's talk about the self-directed IRA a little bit more. So usually, whenever we have four one k, let's see, uh, Fidelity will manage that, right? And also, there's two things Fidelity will do. Well, number one, they're gonna hold the money. And number two, they're gonna control where you send the money to, right? And you know, and they can give you also additional advisory help. They could tell you, hey, buy this, buy that. It's better versus that's that's not better. And then you may choose not to use that, right? When you take that, then but they don't allow you to buy equity. Right? I mean, a hard asset, which is the real estate, and or do some uh, non-equity based you know transaction. Then you have to say, okay, you know what? I'll let Fidelity go. I'll replace. Uh, with someone else who mostly manages uh, will hold my money and manage my transaction and give him a check and making sure that I'm doing the right thing. That's where Quest comes in. But then by design, you are going to take over the ownership of deciding you know, what type of assets you buy, what's good for you, what's not good for you. That's what the self-directed IRA uh, will kind of kick, uh, kick in. So on a typical self-directed IRA, Quest will take the money, hold the money. And number one, number two, they will make sure the transaction follows the rules of the IRA, right? The biggest issue that we get into IRA, it's a, an arm's length transaction. That means I'm selling to my brother, my brother selling to my sister, that kind of stuff, blood relation. Uh, so, and then second biggest thing that we typically get into is that I invest my IRA money into a deal where I have ownership. Those two are a big no-no. Uh, so one of the best thing what Coach will do, they will go through everything. Uh, trust me, they do. So they will go through everything to make sure that you are doing the right thing. And that's the beauty of Coast or any other you know, um, IRA custodian that we have. Now, if you do solo 401k, uh, rules are even lower ownership on you even more. On, a solo, on my solo 401k, I have a blank checkbook. And I have 
whole thing, nobody's checking me. And that is in a good, in a one sense, but in a very, you know, uh, it, it also, if I don't have a structure behind me, it's very problematic uh, because I can, you know, if I don't know enough, I can do crazy things. And if I do crazy things, if I get audited, the whole thing will fall apart. So typically what we say, stick around, have some advisory support, go with someone who can help you check the boxes, making sure that you're doing the right thing. Uh, so, but but either way, you will have a lot more responsibility and you will be able, and also that responsibility comes with freedom. You'll have a lot of freedom to create, you know, uh, more ways of earning, uh, more ways of getting a higher return than a typical index fund. And the last one is the what type of transaction we see. It's a lot on the real estate side. Uh, you could, you could do hard money, you could do equity investment, you can invest in a land, you can invest in, in a syndication, you can invest in a single, somebody else's single family, you can be a transactional fund. There's a lot more things that you can do. Um, a lot of VCs that I know, um, they will you know, invest in a startups from there, but your pool of investment goes away. Now, it sounds all that good, but always remember, uh, we get paid for our uh, knowledge, right? Most of the time. So when you come into real estate, um, for us, or to get into syndication, it's going to be a passive. So you are bringing money into somebody else's operations, uh, and you are not an active participant into that deal where you have uh, decision uh, power. As long as that means you'll be all right from that sense, either you'll be a lender or you'll be an equity investor as passive on that one. So for massive side, we have a team, we have a workflow, we have a process. Uh, it's pretty wide glove for all of our investors. And we've been to, we have a three IRAs uh, company that we worked and uh, we kind of know the process and we follow the sequence uh, pretty quick. So on the left-hand side, it, it gives you that idea on how that works. Uh, the self-directed IRA on the top block that you see, uh, it buys the property. That means it comes into a rental property in this case, multifamily as a passive investor. Um, if you are passive, and then when that gets sold, money gets and you know, money gets back to the IRA. So it's a pretty and you know, a simple uh, from the passive perspective. What what I like to do on the uh, you know an IRA perspective is I look for the speed first, and then cash flow second on my IRA. And once I invested all of my IRA money, then I look for her you know, depreciation to balance out, and then the speed, and then between those two, you'll be okay. So. New development deals uh, are really, really good. If you don't need depreciation, you can invest in everything else. If you need depreciation, you wanna, you know, it's better to spend the post-tax earnings that you have. And if you if you need more return or you know new development kind of sort of deals or land deals where you don't need the depreciation, but they're typically shorter duration, IRA makes a lot of sense. So that's that's there. And also take a look in your IRA again. Uh, from my shell perspective, my IRA was growing and I had those life path 2050, 2030, you know, all those longer term duration, very close to the index funds. It's index funds, right? If I'm comfortable with the average pay, slow pay, fine, let it be. And But I took all of my 401k out and then I deploy it uh, on the syndication under deals. Hey, seven, eight, nine percent versus 17, 18%, all of a sudden my timeline of the same return shrinks. That means if I have 20 years duration to invest, if I stick around with my 401k, whatever return that I would get, I would get way more than that, right? Numerically almost double if I deploy it uh, in a real estate with a higher rate of return. So that's one, that's one there. Thing, one thing yes. too, sure, that's an important thing, you talked a lot about at Roth. Um, big difference, right? So if you have a traditional 401k, you are deferring taxes to a later date. But if yes. you have a Roth, and Zach can answer more questions about this, it is actually a tax-free environment to grow your wealth. So yes. there's a big distinction. Um, you know, I'm sitting here looking, I'm at that age now, 65 this year. I'm trying to figure out how to convert, really grow quickly so that I can earn it tax-free at the next level. Um, big, big difference. And again, all depends on, you know, it may make no sense to pay the tax at one point. Again, it's taking the planning and the decision of when you're going to do it. And of course, there's also a lot of considerations just on your age, right? Somebody 25 
Sherari, I think you're close to 45, I'm 65. We all gonna have a different thing that we need. Um, you know, it, 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 this is the beauty of these things that you need to make sure that you're getting good advice and you have a good plan. And it's not just your IRA specialist, it's an accountant, it's all of the things combined. Um, Cause that plan is going to change what happens to you and how much, again, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. 100%. The way I, I mean, to kind of build up on that, what to do, CPA. How to do it, it's your you know, uh, custodian, right? And if you blend that in, you'll know. And depending on your age, expectation, time horizon, everything is different. So going back to the Roth and the IRA, so pre-tax money, post-tax money, how much, how the money is coming in, will set the stage how the money is going to get out. Payment is due at some point in time, right? Uh, so if I bring in the money into my IRA by paying taxes, then whatever earnings that I have on that money is usually no tax. If I bring in the money pre-tax that I didn't pay the tax and I'm earning it, then when I get out, I have a tax bill due. And then how much money I can bring in, depending on your age, depending on earning, right? So it's a, exactly what you know, Trevor was mentioning. It has some design to it. And also interesting part that if I if we want to bring the money from pre-tax to post-tax, you could do a conversion. That means I have a money which is pre-tax, I didn't pay the tax, but I'm going to break that. Then I make a post-tax and I get into that. So I pay the bill today, then later, right? Then you can also design it. And you can also design a you know, example. My taxable earning today is $100,000, hypothetically. And I need to pay, or let's say you know, 100, let me can amplify. My taxable income today is 200 grand. Then I am, I'm paying a 37% tax. And then happen to be, I want to make a choice of take my pre-tax money and then break into a post-tax account. But my taxable, you know, bracket, my tax bracket, 37%. What I should do, I should design it where my taxable earning is not 200 grand anymore. It's maybe $50,000. So what happens, my tax bracket is the bottom. And then I make a choice to break that bank. So what happens instead of a, paying a tax bill at a 37%, I pay a tax bill at a 15, 20%. And then I take that money. So it has a lot more design to it. The beauty is the control is with you. The key is yours. You get to decide, you get to design, you get to execute. And so then you can design it in whatever way is best for you. So whole idea is that reduce the taxable income, then take the hit if you want to, then get in it and the amplify from there, keep the returns as much as you can. Yeah, 100%. So it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you keep. It is absolutely true. And it sucks. Once you hit that 37%, 40% tax return bracket, it is absolutely sucks. But before I say everybody, make that revenue first. Pay the tax one time or maybe no time, but don't, don't reduce the earning power. Design it. Don't hit that 37% unless you have to. If you do, do a high five, cry for a year. Next year, do a better planning, right? All right, let's get to the second, uh, next slide. All right, so how to invest retirement plan, right? Number one, know your plan's rules. Uh, this again, goal is this, uh, the, our webinar or our once the case studies give you guys ideas, give you guys thought process and example case studies. So you can take that and do the same thing. It's a study, put down a piece of paper, come up with a game plan then go choose yourself directed IRA. If you need additional feedback from a step one and two, reach out to any of our investor relations team, drop a note, join our WhatsApp group, and you know, ask questions, we can go from there. And then once you go from a plan to execution, you designed the game plan, then you transferred the money and you're ready, start looking for step three, which is identify you know, investments option that you wanna deploy it. Go through the process number four, and then go to number five as you go through. So five, one, two, three, four, that's the cycle, it happens. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, uh, one to two, it's a little bit more, uh, at least personally, that when me and Mike, we talked about, it's a lot of options, but it's not a lot, it's really a matrix. Um, you would know really, really quick once you start drafting a game plan for you. But the point is take action. And you know, on that note, if you were to looking for investment, which is step number three, uh, deferral, not deferral, it takes time. Nothing happens instantaneously. So don't get into the December 1st 
and you're thinking about next year tax or you're doing that that year tax filing, talk to your CPA. CPA says, hey, your earning is whatever it is. Let's go do some action. You're not going to have time. So this is a third quarter. This is absolutely a good time to plan because even though you could do one and two, but you may not have number three that you need to execute right at the tail end of the year. So it takes plan and proactive planning. So looking for number three, as it comes, you will do that. And not all the time you can design the number three's timing to get one and two scored away. Talk to everybody, get the money, get the game plan, start starting the uh, step number three. That's so when the time comes, you can execute, thing goes pretty fast. So that's the process it's gonna go through. Uh, let's go to the second slide. And uh, now that is a, a year old slide. I, I think it changed quite a bit. Uh, Mike, I think he hit double digits uh, this year on his uh, Roth IRA. Mine, I, I almost doubled. Uh, so I'm a Roth IRA. I think I have I don't know, 15, 16 uh, transactions. And then I have done syndication and land deals there. I full cycle more than that. I'll pull up my Roth account. I want to pull up my cost account. See. If I can do that. And then, yeah, I started uh, solo for one. So I started in a Roth IRA before that. So I have solo for one as well. I have been very happy with solo and we also Roth at the same time. And Trevor, man, he has done so many. <laughs> I, I put an XX. I wasn't sure when he started. Only the first time he did the first yeah, investment. Well, right. <laughs> we had to remember my world was very different. Um, my, my work had no 401k plan until like the last four years I worked there. So I really didn't have um, very much, but uh, but but I've um, I've almost doubled it in five years right. just through investing. Cool. Yeah, I calculated. I have done ten, about to be a ten in Roth, four in solo, and I have one, two, three, four, five, five exited uh, full cycle. So uh, under the Roth. So that's that's how it works. And then at, at the bottom. And this is how it looks like in a typical model, right? It's a multifamily non-recourse loan will buy the asset on the right side and then self-directed IRA will buy the property recipients, go back and forth. So that's that's the an IRA. All right, so let's get into the last couple of slides. We can wrap up some of the things that we do. So usually this is the top slide, but I'm going to bring it down here. We're always looking for partners. Uh, we do land uh, JV quite a bit. Uh, if you, you know... Uh, uh, we are actively looking for land acquisition. We have one under contract, contract. I don't know. It's like under contract boundary. We signed it. They signed it. They haven't given to us yet. We should have the contract sometime next week. And then retail JV development, uh, class A locations, one to 40 acres. And uh, JV, it's, we are partnering with the land owners directly where they are committing the land as an LP. We come in with the construction team. We do the construction as we go. So it's a joint venture. When we're raising equity, the land comes in as an equity. We have one coming up. Uh, we are working towards it with one of the large land owners in Austin area. Uh, it's eight months into the process. They are pledging their land that is worth about $17 million. And then we are bringing in the balance sheet and the construction and the, and the rest of the stuff as you go through. Multifamily side, uh, you know, from the new acquisition, uh, that's our buy box, 1980 or newer, 150 or more, pitch roof, no coastal areas, that has been our buy box. Uh, we deviate some time depending on uh, the return. Uh, we also do construction services, uh, the number, uh, that's depending on the team. And uh, we, number three, we do quite a bit, which is the debt and loan guarantor, we'll KPD loan. And the four, if, if someone has a large portfolio, will come back and do some asset advisory to help turn around. Uh, so we have done 400 units assets in Dallas. We, we came in as a secondary partner, but when the time was rough, we became a co-lead and we helped them out with their asset. Now asset is in a stable condition. We are backing out there leading it. Last thing is we have the massive masters. Uh, so if you have land, again, uh, we get a lot of questions on that one. Land development right now is working only for solid class A. Yes, we would like to buy those up and coming. It, it's not working anymore. The numbers not going around. Uh, the numbers are working right now uh, for the new construction is the properties where it's up and came already, where money is coming in, new construction happening, densely populated, and those kind of areas. And within the construction, uh, we are still being able to make the retail construction. Multifamily is very tough, extremely tough because of we have so much of an oversupply. 
uh, especially in the Texas area, there is no new demand with that. The, or the supply has to go through the correction optimization so for new construction. So all the multifamily that we're seeing that penciling out, uh, you know, those are either somebody's getting out right now, they have to because loan matured and or they have gone through all the phases, one piece missing. But the retail is also working, which was a bigger, so we saw that happening two years ago. So we worked our way, get closer into the development company, partnering with them, hold to the process. That was one of the driver, I mean, that was that driver for Massive to bolt onto Realty One to build that pipeline uh, where identifying class A locations that is not on the market and building those class A development process uh, because there is a natural barrier to entry uh, to lease or place tenants, uh, but on the, you know, and and the uh, suburbs area where new homes are still selling, new money is coming in, and then it's services. And those areas are really working. Uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about it. The deal that we have, that under contract we're talking about, um, that came from a 30 years relationship, business to business relationship, and that is completely off market. That is completely hand designed. They gave us a 19 acres to do a lot of stuff. We said, yeah, I would love to, time is bad. So I want to do this. They said, take this piece of land. We said, no, we don't like that piece of land. Let us design that the parcel that we want to take out from that 19 acres, right? Uh, so that's how we design uh, those um, uh, those new construction deal. Uh, so there's another construction deal coming up next year. That's a 30 acres in Katy area. Similar thing. The developer is developing 1,100 acres. And they have just said, you know, Realty One, go build this town center. This is your play. And we go in and we say, you know what? We don't like the design. We don't like the location. We don't want the lake to be in that side versus this side. And so it's really awesome to work on those projects. Those are not in the market. Those are not available. No competition. It's us and the developers. We are designing the land size, the track size, the building type, the look and the aesthetics of it. And But the return is you know, better. So risk adjusted, that's a better return than competing. So we are very open. We understand the market dynamics and we try to bring in better risk adjusted return you know, type projects to everybody else, especially to our investors. Let's go to the next one. Next slide. Oh, somebody, uh, somebody asked the question. So uh, it's, uh, so our massive masters, uh, one of the questions we get, what is the massive masters? What we call it is this, Entrepreneurial spirit, everybody, all of us, we need to have it. We must have it to move forward in life. Entrepreneurship, it's not for everybody. So it takes a different type of skill set, different type of background to be successful as a multifamily operator or as a general partner. And we don't talk that, we don't talk about that enough. Just because I flipped a single family home, it does not make me a strong partner to run a 150 units home. Conceptually, I get it. But it doesn't make me, right? So it takes a certain skill set. So for us, when we built the Massive Masters, we looked at from the skill set perspective. Because the moment we become a general partner, we are bringing in somebody's hard-earned money that's in the bank account sitting out there, which is different than stock money. I don't see it, right? And we have a fiduciary duty of investing that money. And if I don't understand macroeconomics, if I don't understand microeconomics, if I don't understand you know, the whole capital stack up and down, how can I be a CEO of a $16 million company, which is a $16 million on a property? I can't. My resume doesn't tell me so. So oftentimes we see a lot of those kind of mistakes. And most of the folks who came into that route, market was better, mistake was you know, forgotten, we made money, but the true resume showed up. So when we built the Massive Masters, we looked at from that perspective. Let us be the bad team and tell you, hey, you want to be a general partner, but not the way you were thinking, please take it this way, it's gonna help you be successful more and faster. So when we build this Massive Masters, that was our goal. It is a highly vetted community for business owners, real estate investors and corporate employees who want to be general partners, respecting your resume, right? And so that's what, and let us help you, you know, give you simulations of it, give you case studies of it. We have done 15 syndications. Yes, we thought we know everything, but hell, we didn't. We made mistakes 15 times on top of all the other mistakes that we have avoided. We have underwritten 1,200 you know, properties. There are some new ones to it. So we give access to that to everybody else to say, hey, mistakes will happen, 
but let's reduce the amount of mistakes and reduce the cost of mistakes. So you, uh, whoever comes in to that is there. And if we believe it's not the right time for you, we'll let you know. We have had people, you know, it's got two single family resident or residential, uh, did a flip. I got it. I'm working W2. My first property, I'm going to buy $13 million. Never raised. I barely got $100,000. I can run the asset. I believe I can run the asset and I'll buy myself. Fantastic. You come sign the loan for me. Sorry to break the news. You're not ready yet. Let's go do some homework first. Take some tests. Once you're ready, come and do it for us, right? So that's how we build the Massive Masters, that to make sure that we build the skill set before you take the reign and responsibility of you know, your money or somebody else's money. All right, uh, let's go to the second slide. And that's what I know, that's what we always you know, say, look, education is expensive, doesn't matter where you go, right? Uh, it, it, it is tough, it, it, it is tough when you cut a check and then you, you can get a result out of it. So we always say our education is expensive, you'll be challenged and it is a time investment and it, it, it's work, right? Uh, and it's and it's okay. We understand it's just not for everybody. Uh, so at the same time, we want you. You don't. I mean, we believe that it, we live in a world where education is. Free. It should be available for everybody. I don't have to pay to know how to underwrite, right? I should be able to get enough pulse about it to decide whether it's a good or bad for us. So, which is why we do those free webinars. We do those very low cost, uh, you know, in person conferences where you take you through the whole process of what does it look like, and then you decide what you want to do, right? So always keep in mind, whatever that you do, you're going to become a CEO or CEO of millions of dollars of worth company or portfolio. It takes a certain kind of resume. Uh, and that is not, you know, that is tough to uh, gain in a very short, short amount of time, unless you got a coach, right? Unless you got a whole team. Uh, so that's that. Um, awesome. So... That's all I had for the day, I guess. And oh, the, uh, one more slide. So I think Mike Mike put it in. Mike is in here. And this is our process. Uh, whenever we sign, if someone comes up, uh, on the left-hand side, you join. Then we, we take you through a whole bunch of stuff, like a whole bunch of stuff. It's like a course, like a data dump. We, we do it with you. Then we ask the question, okay, mentally how you feel about it, right? And then you decide you want to be a fund manager, or you want to be acquisition specialist, or you want to be an asset manager. Uh, we specialize, we kind of put the asset manager uh, as, as, a, as a green, because to us, that's the most sought out. That's your and highly vetted and, you know, operation work. It is a special type of skill set. It takes a lot to get there, because to be a really good asset manager, you got to know really, you, you got to be a really good acquisition specialist and or deal finder. And then you also have to be a really good and you know, a fund manager. Once you couple that together, you're a really good asset manager. Uh, so that's that's why we put it that at the very end. It takes a lot to be a good asset manager. It takes a lot to be a good fund manager, and it takes a lot to be a good acquisition uh, or deal finder. Uh, you know, just because somebody sent us an email, and just because you can look at some cold star, it does not mean the deal is good, right? There's always some actual data goes in and then they underwrite it. And once you underwrite so many deals, you may not own the you know, deals, but you could tell how a deal will behave. Once you get to that stage, you got your game. So that's that's our process that it kind of goes through. That's awesome. all we had today. Uh, Trevor, back all to right. you. Open for questions. Anything well, else? I got a question, Zach. What did we miss big? I mean, maybe, you know, what anything that you think? I mean, Anything big that you think we missed about the space? Um, so I mean, nothing, nothing really as far as the mechanics go. You know, that that's that 90% of the deals, I'd say even 95% of the deals, they're gonna operate, you know, pretty straightforward, as, you know, as you described. Really, the only nuanced ones are the things um, you know, where you get like you mentioned, where it's taxed, you know, I'm sorry, it's a debt leverage. And then that could affect you know, how the income is treated within the IRA, uh, you know, in regards to like UDFI, how, you know, how you go about handling that, uh, what that looks like within the IRA versus kind of, you know, incurring that taxation as the individual. Um, but, you know, we can kind of open that can of worms, you know, if, if anyone has specific questions. But other than that, yeah, that's a quest presentation through and through. <laughs> well, we got taught trained by the best. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and again, it, 
I got to say this over and over again, right? Always be learning. I mean, I just went to a Crest Expo and there was a few things I was talking to Marie and our team today. I had no idea about certain things. Um, you know, you, you've always got to be learning so that you can provide for us the best path for our investors to build financial independence, right? That's this whole game. That's that, that is what we're doing here. So um, anybody have any questions, you can unmute yourself. You can pop them in the chat. Um, and let's try to keep the, these first questions at least uh, re retirement fund focused so that Zach doesn't have to stay um, too much longer. But I do appreciate you coming. Um, he saved my bacon. I forgot to ask. <laughs> and I woke up this yesterday going, or if, and even I went, hold on a minute. I didn't ask Zach to come. So thank you so much for coming. Been a My great absolutely. partner. Well, absolutely. I appreciate that. And yeah, I'll, I'll stay as long, as long as we need to, just be sure we get all the questions answered. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions? And and the question come. So I'll share a little, you know, joke i guess so my son he's growing up he's he's 14 about to be 15 and you know he he loves history and especially the world wars and the fascism and the you know the capitalist society and everything so he, he he's a history buff so we were in europe we came back and we're talking about it so last year he started the thing he had learned something somewhere he said tax abatement he's a little kid for some reason he that that somehow got into his head that reaches and like people who make money, they still they don't pay tax. He was hard on it. Like I, I mean, whatever, right? Fine, good point. And uh, typical, that's what you hear. Maybe we went to some Instagram, some TikTok video. That's all we got. And then over time, uh, here, like last week, we just got home. We're talking about it. I had a transaction. I explained that to him. He was like. I think that's a good deal because I, I did that on my Roth IRA, right? <laughs> I was like, look, so now go back. Is it the abatement or is it an option for you as a 14 years to have because you could have a custodian account on the Roth IRA, right? So he finally saw it and he wants to open up a Roth IRA with me or IRA with me as a, as a custodian account so he can buy assets, he can invest with me. So I was laughing so hard inside. I was like, dad, you have done a good job. So I didn't example, yeah. and then now point to everybody else here, right? I don't have any in you know, a college funds, nothing at all. I have in you know, a 401ks for them. And I mean, you know, uh, I raise for them. That's, that's how I do it because, you know, you are in control of how much you know, money you can earn and how much money you can put in. Uh, but anyway, so that's also for all the parents out there. Hey, have them buy assets as well. And one of the coolest things that I found out is I cannot trade or we can buy together, right? Number one, mm, number two, good. if I don't want 100% of the profit, maybe I could give him 100% of the profit, I could get 0% of the profit because you get to design what the profit share looks like. So be creative about it, follow the rules. And those that I have, that we have as an adult, it's available for the kids as well. And the best thing is, what's the biggest issue of the underage folks? They cannot sign a contract. That means they cannot buy any hard assets. If you have an IRA, a study and account, I mean, hell, that problem is gone. That's All right. right. So, so think it through. Use that for your family. Use that for your kids. Maximize all the things available for us, and continue investing. Yeah, and honestly, uh, you know, uh, to that end, the Roth, the Roth is its strongest when it has time on its side. Yeah, that at the end of the day, that that's really how it operates. The earlier you can start using Roth, the stronger a Roth becomes. Um, you know. It, like you said, you're paying taxes on the way in, but the growth, the growth is where the Roth really strengthens. So you're given more time, it's going to grow more. That means you're more, more tax savings, more distributions that are coming out tax, you know, tax ability free. And that's where you really, it really starts to shine. Once you stop recording, I'll, I'll walk you through some, you know, numbers as well. It'd be interesting. I don't want to go off record. Yeah, that's as funny as hell. One of my friends did it. I saw it. I was like, that's amazing. And not just, for this particular call, maybe, but one thing I did learn when I was at the conference act, and I want to learn more about, was using my traditional IRA funds to invest into something that might 
in short term lose some of its value. So mm -hmm. like, for example, a new development that loses its value. So put $100,000 in something, but my market appraised value on that because it hasn't done anything, it hasn't grown, may have reduced. Then I can convert the reduced amount to a Roth. And that got me super excited. So, um, so you can take it and then you only pay the tax on the reduced fair market value. Is that correct, Zach? Yeah, that's absolutely right. This is this is a strategy known as uh, the J curve, right? If you ever hear the term the J curve, that's what that's what people you know that's what they're describing, right? So, uh, whatever, say you make an investment, um, and like I said, into a new development deal, right? So the first first couple of years, you're getting those K ones, and you're seeing this negative value, and you're you know, I guess it. it if you were an investor just coming in, you're not really aware of what's going on and what that K1 is actually saying. You know, it can be a little worrisome. You're saying, I'm seeing my investment dip in value. I'm seeing these, you know, it's in the red right now. And I'm getting a little nervous. But like you said, there there is opportunity. And when it comes to actually making these moves, um, honestly, getting from traditional to Roth, that can be a tough sell because of the tax, you know, the tax burden on that conversion. But what that J curve allows is, like you said, I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna get a fair market value when it's at its lowest point. Because it's at its lowest point, let's say I made a hundred thousand dollar investment, I get it, re, you know, evaluated, and now all of a sudden we're looking at a value of you know fifty thousand. Let's just say just for ease of numbers. Well, if I do my conversion at that point, well now I'm doing a conversion on a fifty thousand dollar asset versus a hundred thousand dollar asset. Right. So I just saved you know, the, a, a bunch of that tax burden yeah. on that conversion. And from there, it's going to grow back up. Right. Because this is all planned. We we knew this would happen. It's going to have that dip in value because it's not producing anything. But we're spending a lot to develop this property. So that natural growth now is going to come back in the Roth IRA. And it, it just it's just a, it, it's kind of a genius way. It just it's a beautiful yeah, way to I was, uh, really maximize your tax savings. I, did it I was sitting in the room I going, I was, like, God I was damn trying it. to think how to do it. How do I convert without, you know, and I was thinking, okay, this year is a low income year, um, mm -hmm. just the way it is. Maybe I should do it then. And then when I was at the thing, I went, wait a minute. Again, if you could figure it out, right, especially if you're, you know, if, if somehow figure out, okay, this deal is going to lose value, but still going to double my money and or whatever in the time, but do the conversion then, super yeah. powerful way. Again, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And then oh, that nice. would be converted to a Roth. And then even that own investment can continue to grow in a tax free environment versus tax deferred. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to, let's say, if anyone wants to do conversion, they should start, I'm just kind of simplifying, they should start with the construction projects, right? So you come in heavy, get it down, get a lower basis, and then you kind of convert there. Then you kind of come back with that one. Yeah. I wish I would, though. Yeah, we might, have, we might have done this today in the investor uh, relations the, call. Yes, we might have, yes. we might have been taught oh, by somebody today. from the course owes me my tax money back to me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Whatever money I'm, somebody from course owes me yeah. my money. Is all of mine still there? And I've been thinking, how do I get it out? Because I'm get, getting that close, right? I'm going to want to start taking it in my seventies, anyways, uh, at some point. And I was thinking, okay, how do I do this? And then I, I went to that webinar and I was like, wait a minute, so. Um, at some point, I want to learn more about it because it could, again, be a powerful tool for Massive to use for our investors to help them even, you know, get that much more advantage. Because um, there's there's a lot of people in my boat, I'm sure, that w that want to convert but don't want to pay the tax. Oh, yeah. That's well, right. Yeah. Definitely, because I mean, one of the one of the largest ways people will fund their IRAs is going to be from that 401k, and unless you specify that otherwise, you know, all the contributions that you've been making, as well as the contributions that your employer have been making, are made as pre-tax contributions. That's right. right. So when you're rolling them over, you're rolling them over to an account that matches that that pre-tax status, which is where the traditional IRA comes into play. That's why it's so popular. Right. That's why it's such a common uh, account type within the United States. And then you, you you find out about the Roth and you go, okay, how do I get these funds over from here to here? And that's when you say, okay, that tax burden, that's the big one. How can I mitigate that, right? How can I minimize my tax burden while also maximizing my growth? It's a bit, it, it's just, it's it kind of a perfect way to do it. Zach, let's say it, hypothetically, yeah. I don't want to, go ahead, sorry. Somebody was saying something. Well, go ahead, sorry. Somebody was saying something. Well, let, let me ask you in today's, because of, interest rates because of uh, insurance and impacts of those things to NOI 
at the end of the day. Valuations and some portfolios are down. Is there a way you can take, make le lemonade out of lemons in that could you, based on those valuations be down, being down, take advantage of mitigating your tax burden and and go from a you know traditional or 401k solo, whatever you've got there, and go into a Roth and and then ride the wave, hopefully, to when things correct and be in a better position? Is that is that a possibility to do? Uh, make lemonades out of lemon. So when it comes to that that conversion that we're doing, right, one of the things that we require is that we get a third party valuation coming in, right? So that third party valuator, that's kind of going to be the discussion that you'll have with them, right? So talking about okay, what you know, what would we be looking at? You know, if I were to get this valuation right now, you know, would it be coming in at a lower than my investment point initially was? And if that's the case, then that you know that strategy would work. It's kind of hard to give that as like a blanket yes or no. Uh, it's kind of like a possibly, right? Possibly that that absolutely could work. Um, but I'd be hesitant to say like yes for sure, you know, without a doubt. Um, I don't know if you guys want to kind of expand on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let me let me jump on it. So, Stephen, it's going to work if you have an updated K one with a re, uh, uh, new price. Because from the Zach perspective, he's looking for my cost basis, right? Yeah, I invested hundred thousand dollars. And that year I had a K1 hypothetically for $100,000. But if the new K1 shows up at a $50,000, there's a spread, you can max, I think you can work that out, right, Zach? Mm -hmm. But there has to be a new K1 with a newly stated price. So, and so two things, right? One is the, I believe valuation went down, which is one down, uh, but on paper, do I have the new valuation or not? So going back to what Zach was mentioning, somebody has to come back and reappraise that property and reissue a K1 that has a lower or different price point. And if there's a, a delta between those previous K1 and new K1, as a, you know, with the negative delta, then you can use that for the same thing what we talked about, the whole, whole J curve of it. So yes, possible, we need hard data. That means the K1, to populate the K1, probably you'll need somebody to you know, appraise the property as you kind of go through. Okay, now, but anytime there's a capital call out there, and I, I I have not in any of my 14 different um, portfolio properties have not been blessed with that. And I say that facetiously, so I'm lucky there. But I know a lot of other people who have not been so lucky. Uh, and anytime there's a capital call out there, I would think that they're a candidate for that evaluation of, you know, from lemons to lemonade, as I call it there. But... Yes. So yes. if there is a capital call and that is a meaningful size, then when the restatement happens of the property valuation, then probably there's going to be a K1, right? And then with the restatement of the K1, you should be able to do it. Now, in theory, yes. In execution, is that big enough, wide enough to do this? We don't know. So yes, uh, in theory, somebody should be able to take that gap and, and execute on it. It's 100%. Yeah. Good question. Very good question. Awesome. Any other questions? And again, we really appreciate it. We know we're on the verge of a holiday weekend. You're all going to go eat fattening things and watch fireworks. I'm ready for that one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Any I'm other ready? questions? It's good to see you, Marjorie, even though you're in a... She's, she's in Florida with poor Wi-Fi, so... But... Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, so, yep. Cool. That's awesome. So uh, what I was mentioning is, you know, uh, um, we all hang out with the real estate investors, right? That's like, uh, that's what we do. And what, I, I didn't quite click it early on where the kids, you know, I knew about the kids could have the IRA, but I, I wasn't getting them involved. The IRA, but I was but then involved. one of my friends said that they buy properties together on the same side, because on the same side, you can do the transaction on the opposite side, right? So family, kids, and everything else. And then, you know, we got into the conversation, all the dads came about the college fund. I always said, hey, college fund, fine. If we don't know anything, have a college fund. Uh, and if you want to spend the time to have something, don't have a college fund, right? So so uh, anyway, so we're talking about it. Then he goes, I got my college fund in the IRA. I was like, what does that mean? Uh, this is what he explained. He said, 
I, I, I always invest. And what I do, I got the kids started with the least amount of money. That's in this case, $5,000, hypothetically. And the investment needed is, you know, $100,000. So what he's going to do or he does is that he puts in the 95, kids put the five, it's $100,000. They go in, they work it out. But when the return comes back, kids get to 90% of the return, he gets the 10% of the return. All of a sudden, he can synthetically grow the expected rate of return and not by the distribution of the capital by choice. And the kids fund goes enough to a point by the time they will come to the college, they could borrow against it, pay their bills. I was like, man, I wish I knew it when my kids are young, <laughs> right? You can decide. Awesome. It's not a 50-50 partnership, right? It could be, you know, 99-1 partnership. Who cares for how much capital you put it in? It's it's your family. Uh, this is an interesting way of seeing the distribution of uh, this stuff. So really awesome. Love IRAs. Love solo 401ks, have it, even though you have a 401k, if you don't know what to do with it, if you're scared, fine. For the longest I had a 401k, I didn't touch it. And I just had a Roth IRA, have both. Have three if you want to, right? Have a solo, have a Roth, have a 401k, but have something so you have more ammunition to play with. Yeah, I think it's always, I always tell people, you know, at, at the very minimum, if you're thinking, if you're even considering, a, you know, a Roth at some point, maybe even if you're not, it, it never hurts to have one. Uh, the reason is because that five-year clock that comes with the Roth IRA, uh, the earlier you can start that clock to where it's not something you have to worry about down the line, I mean, the better. You know, as, as long as the Roth IRA is, is funded, that clock starts, right? And there's no you know, sort of like minimum to say funded, well, what's funded, you know? I have a Roth IRA. Uh, when I first started, I had a Roth IRA. I put a hundred bucks in and that was it. My clock started right then and there. And it's going to be good now for any Roth IRAs I establish in the future. The, those clock doesn't restart every time I'm starting a Roth IRA. It starts the year, the first year you fund. Um, and that way down the line, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. So Zach, talk a little I bit. I did let's, not let's know that. So, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So I'm calling you Monday to fund one. That's right. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I um, did not know that. Yes. Oh, to, to kind of expand on that, you know, what we're looking at is the Roth IRA has to be seasoned, right? So, uh, you know, we always talk about what the strength of the Roth IRA is that distributions are going to come out tax and penalty free. Well, in order to for those to come out tax and penalty free, it has to be what's called a qualified distribution, right? But what is a qualified distribution? Well, in a traditional IRA, for it to be qualified, the moment you hit 59 and a half, boom, qualified, right? Um because really, it's, you know, you'll pay taxes on it as as it's uh, coming out. So all the funds sitting there are going to be sitting pre-tax, and that's a given. However, Roth IRA it's a little bit more complex, right? The funds that we put in there, well, our contributions, those were taxed. Those are sitting post-tax, right? And that goes as well for any conversions that we did. So funds that came over from our traditional IRA to our Roth IRA. But what about the earnings? Earnings are sitting in there having never been taxed. Taxes never touched that. So you can't just say, oh, well, I'll take a distribution because not all the dollars are treated equally. So they have the Roth ordering rules, right? So first to start off for a qualified distribution to come out, it's got to meet two requirements. One is that your Roth has been open and funded for five years, right? Not just that single Roth, but you've had a Roth IRA open and funded. It started that five-year seasoning clock. The second is that you've reached a, what's called a triggering event. The most common one being 59 and a half. That's where you hear a lot of people say that's the second requirement. Um, there's a couple of different things that can happen. Essentially, you know, what you're looking at is the 72T. With, that's what they call 72T exemptions. But let's just say five years, 59 and a half, right? Well, when you pull them out, the reason is because they're going to come out as in, in, uh, in the order of the Roth ordering rules. So the first thing that comes out of those contributions right? Funds that I put in for my own pocket, my own checking or savings. I pay taxes on them already. Uncle Sam doesn't care what I do with that money. So because of that, Roth contributions can come out tax and penalty free, no matter what age you are and no matter how long you've had the account open, right? That's one of the advantages of a Roth IRA is that those contributions come out tax and penalty free, no matter what. The second thing that's going to come out are going to be your conversions, Right. These are funds, like I said, came over from your pre-tax account and you pay taxes on it on the conversion. So they're never going to be taxed, but they could very well be penalized with that 10 percent penalty if you're under the age of 59 and a half. Right. So that's the second thing that's going to come out. The final thing that's going to come out is going to be the conversions. Right. I'm sorry. Are the earnings. The final thing is going to be the earnings that are going to come out. Well, like I said before, earnings have never been touched by taxation. Because they've never been touched by ta touched by taxation, the IRS looks at them very carefully, right? So they could be subject to both tax and penalty if you're not making a qualified distribution. 
And that's where these five-year clocks going to come in, right? And that's where your age is going to come in. So if you're over the age of 59 and a half and you've had a Roth IRA open and funded for five years, you meet those, you're done. Now it doesn't matter what's coming out. It doesn't matter how much you take out. Everything's coming out tax and penalty free. But let's say you're in a situation where your Roth IRA hasn't aged five years, right? So it hasn't aged five years. And now let's talk about if you're under the age 59 and a half. Well, that means those earnings are going to be subject to taxation as they come out. And they're also going to be subject to the 10% penalty, right? The premature distribution penalty. Now, the second scenario, let's say you haven't aged at five years, but you are over the age of 59 and a half. Well, 59 and a half is a triggering event, right? It, it nullifies that 72T ruling. So because of that, you're not going to pay penalties on it, but you will owe taxation, income tax on the earnings themselves. All right, so it's very important to get that five-year clock started for that Roth to be as strong as it possibly can. Because as long as you haven't met that five-year rule, what you've done is you've really capped that Roth to say only my contributions and converting versions come out tax and penalty free, right? But my earnings are still locked in there. So something to consider. Uh, that's why I always say it, it's always, I mean, obviously I am. I, I, I can't give you any sort of tax legal investment advice, but I've never, I've never seen it. Uh, I've never seen it be detrimental to have a Roth and start the five-year clock. Because I mean, there, there's really Zach, no- Zach, what if it's a five years, but I'm not 59? Mm -hmm. What if I have the Roth for five years, uh -huh. but I'm younger than 59? What happens when I so take- So if you're younger Roth? than 59, it's going to depend on why you're pulling it out, right? So if you've aged five years, you've met that first qualification. But if you're pulling it out, Contributions come out tax and penalty free. Not a problem. That's always right. Uh, conversions. Conversions could be subject to that 10% penalty as if this wasn't complex enough. I say they could be subject to 10% penalty because each conversion has its own unique five-year clock. Once you convert the funds, if they're sitting in the Roth for five years or longer, they're going to be treated as contributions, right? So they won't be penalized. If the conversion that you're distributing has not been sitting in there for five years, it will be subject to that 10% penalty. All right. Finally, if I'm taking the distribution of those earnings, right, while I have met the five-year clock, it is still not a qualified distribution. It is not a qualified distribution if I don't have that second triggering event. So if I'm taking it just because I need the money and there's really no other reason, right? And, and that could be, you know, not that it's a bad idea, but you know, you can enter into a financial situation where I need the money that's worth the taxes. So be it, but you will be taxed and penalized on it. Now, what are some of the other reasons? Well, let's say um, I'm using this as, towards a first time home purchase, right? The IRS says I can use up to $10,000 from my Roth IRA as a first time home purchase, and it will not be taxed or penalized. It's going to be considered another 72T event. All right, so I have the five years and now the second qualifying event, tax and penalty free. Uh, if I'm using it for higher education expenses, higher education expenses is, a, is another exception that not many people realize is there. That's why people will utilize the Roth as sometimes as an education account, right? Because that offers uh, certain qualifying education expenses can come out of the Roth IRA and meet that second qualification rather than you being 59 and a half. Um, another reason could be, you know, ideal here is death and disability. So if it's an inherited Roth IRA, that's going to meet that second qualification. Um, if it's due to long-term disability, uh, that could make the, the meet the second qualification. So it's really going to depend on why those funds are coming out. If you're in a situation that you've met your five years, but you're still under 59 and a half. So let's say uh, make it simple. I feel like taking the money out. Right. All right. I, I, subject then, to tax and penalty. So, uh, which is 10% plus my income tax level at that time. Right, exactly. So it's just awesome. So I'm going to set that up. I, I did this setup going back for my kids, right? So I have a business, my kids work, and I, I pay them X amount of dollars. That's the earning that goes into the IRA, right? First of all, that money to me, I'm that, that's a cost to me. It's an earning for them, but below the threshold, so that 37%, all of a sudden they gained it. At least I would just gained it, right? Because of the cost to me, I just because I paid it to them, that's that's a little below the tax.